Hello, I'm Bob Ehrlich, and I'd like to tell you a story about the hunt for the hypothetical faster-than-light particle called a tachyon. More information about this scientific detective story can be found in my book, Hunting the Faster-than-Light Tachyon and Finding Three Unicorns on a Herd of Elephants. The story has three main parts. First, we'll take a look at some tachyon basics, especially involving relativity. Then we'll consider the only known particle that might be a tachyon, namely the neutrino. And then finally, I'll explain why I and a number of other physicists believe that some neutrinos are tachyons. Here are some of my fellow tachyon hunters. This, of course, is far from a complete collection. A star has been put on George Sudeshan's picture. While he was not the first to contemplate faster than light particles, he was the one who first realized in 1962 that such particles could exist without conflicting with Einstein's relativity. Erasmus Rikami also has a star, since he's probably written more papers on tachyons than anyone else. I've shown myself without any star, but with a wig gazing into a crystal ball. The crystal ball is my tachyon device to receive messages from the future. Just kidding, of course. The device is actually a plasma globe, that's part of my act when I put on a science show for kids. All right, I know I'm being a bit tacky here, but isn't that appropriate in a presentation about tachyons? It was Einstein's relativity that established the link between faster than light speed and time travel. Of course, there is a difference between time travel of people and that of messages. If tachyons really do exist, they raise the possibility of receiving messages from the future alternatively communicating with the past. But even if tachyons do exist, we certainly don't have the technology to use them to build a so-called anti-telephone which would allow such communication. However, one fanciful anti-telephone contraption has been built by Dublin artist Sinead MacDonald. Let's consider a possible scheme that might actually send a message back in time, assuming tachyons do exist. Here's how you might use tachyons to send a message to your past self. The scheme uses a ring of orbiting satellites. The tachyon message is first relayed from the tower to the nearest satellite, which instantly relays it to the next one and the next one and so forth, continuing around the ring for many loops. To send this message further back in time, you need to increase the number of loops the tachyons make and also choose a satellite and tachyon speeds appropriately. Just to take an example, if the tachyon speed was 27 times the speed of light, messages would not go back in time at all until the satellite speed was 1 27th the speed of light. The feasibility of this scheme is completely unknown, and it depends most importantly on whether tachyons exist. But even if they do exist, Many physicists believe they still could not be used to send message, messages to the past. We all make many mistakes in life, and who would not want to send a message to their past self? This possibility raises all kinds of other questions. What would you tell your past self? Some people might want to tell them what stocks to buy, but I suspect many others would want to caution them about some actions maybe they should avoid taking. If you only sent one message, how could you convince your past self that the message was genuine and not a joke or a scam? Sending messages to the past would create all sorts of paradoxes, particularly if the messages resulted in changing the past. For example, if future scientists faced a grave threat to planet Earth, perhaps an imminent asteroid impact, they could alert people years back in time to easily take some minor action to remove that future threat. But if the corrective action were then taken and catastrophe averted, the future scientists would have had no reason to send the message in the first place. Another paradox is known as the bootstrap paradox. It involves inventions or discoveries lacking an inventor. Let's say Einstein was not really the person who discovered relativity. Instead, someone in the future sent him all the details after reading about relativity in modern physics books. Suppose after receiving that information, Einstein, then a failed job seeker, published the great discovery under his own name. In that case, where would the idea of relativity have come from? 
Now, a paradox is a proposition that only seems self-contradictory or absurd. So the existence of these paradoxes does not rule out the possibility of sending messages to the past. Why are so many physicists tacky on skeptics? It doesn't help that the very word has been used for health products that supposedly harness some tachyon energy. Moreover, within physics itself, the word tachyon has another meaning that does not involve faster than light speed particles. More importantly, no such particles have ever been observed in an experiment, despite many false reports. Tachyons, if they exist, would have all kinds of weird properties, including an imaginary mass, meaning that the square of the mass would be negative. Even if they could not be used to send messages back in time, tachyons would exhibit reversals of cause and effect. An example would be the case of firing a gun with tachyon bullets, which would appear to some observers to enter rather than leave the gun. In addition, tachyons might even destabilize the universe by the spontaneous creation of positive and negative pairs of them out of the vacuum. If it should happen that tachyons are conclusively discovered in an experiment, I'd be very surprised if the universe would suddenly vanish in a puff of smoke. Surely clever physicists would come up with theories that can comfortably accommodate them despite their weird properties. Einstein, in his first 1905 relativity paper, wrote, Faster than light speeds have no possibility of existence. His prohibition of faster than light speed originated from an imagined experiment that Einstein thought of when he was only 16 years old. Einstein often did such Gedanken or thought experiments to clarify his ideas. The thought experiment that Einstein imagined at age 16 involved chasing after a light beam and moving at its speed. In that case, the light beam would appear stationary, just like another car appears stationary when your car has the same speed. In effect, the light beam chaser would see a stationary electromagnetic wave, which Einstein realized could not exist based on Maxwell's well-established equations. Therefore, Einstein concluded that catching up to and moving with a light beam was impossible. And surely, if you couldn't catch up to a light beam, you could not go faster than it either. Einstein's ban on faster than light speeds referred specifically to the speed of light in vacuum. This speed is about 300 million meters per second and is usually represented by the lowercase letter c in physics. For a transparent medium like water or glass, where light has a reduced speed, it is perfectly okay to have a particle traveling faster than light in that medium. In such a case, a moving charged particle creates what is known as Cherenkov radiation. This radiation is in the form of a conical shock wave. This is very similar to the wake of a boat. It is also similar to the shock wave occurring when a jet aircraft moves through air at supersonic speed, giving rise to a sonic boom. Cherenkov radiation, however, is in the form of visible light and not sound. It results in the eerie bluish glow around the underwater core of a nuclear reactor. This glow is due to electrons in the water moving faster than three quarters C, the speed of light in water. Here's another allowed faster than light speed. If you pointed a laser pointer directly at the moon and waved it past the moon, the spot on the moon's surface could travel faster than light. For this to happen, you'd need to sweep the beam across the moon's diameter in about a hundredth of a second, which is quite doable. The reason this does not conflict with Einstein's ban on faster than light speed is because that ban really only applies to moving masses or energy, not the motion of light spots or shadows. There's quite a few other examples of allowed cases of faster than light speeds, including one that Einstein himself considered to be very spooky. Normally, observations we make at two locations cannot instantly affect each other. For example, if you and your friend at opposite ends of the Earth were to flip coins simultaneously, each of your flips would have a random outcome independent of the other. But now imagine you used a pair of magic coins 
such that each landed randomly, but somehow they always landed with the same side up. Of course, there are no magic coins, but pairs of subatomic particles can become entangled. This means that the outcome of an observation of one particle instantly affects the outcome of the other, no matter how far apart they are. It is as though nature is sending quantum information from one particle's location to the other at faster than light speed. Either that, or st scientists at the two remote locations only think they are making independent choices of what to measure, because everything in the universe is actually determined. Quantum entanglement, the effect that Einstein called spooky, has now been observed, and surprisingly for objects much larger than subatomic particles, in this case for a pair of tiny drums. Could magic coins just be a matter of time? The idea of the speed of light being a universal speed limit for a moving object really does seem kind of crazy. Here, for example, is a simple way you might imagine you could reach or exceed the speed of light. Suppose you're in a spaceship which accelerated at 1g. With that acceleration, your speed would increase at a rate of about 10 meters per second every second. And you'd feel like you were back on Earth and not floating around. As the seconds passed, your speed after 1, 2, and 3 seconds would be 10, 20, and then 30 meters per second. With that rate of increase, you'd think that you could reach light speed, about 300 million meters per second, in a time of 30 million seconds. That works out to be just about a year. However, this conclusion would be false, because Einstein showed that an object's mass increases with its speed, becoming infinite as the speed approaches the speed of light. It would therefore take an infinite amount of energy to bring the ship up to light speed. The graph shows how the mass and energy of a moving particle depends on its speed. Notice how both quantities become infinite at the speed of light, that is, when v over c equals 1. Notice also that the colors of light all have a speed exactly equal to c, as indicated by the three circles. In 1962, George Sudeshan and two colleagues proposed an idea which extended Einstein's formula into the realm of faster than light speed. The graph for V greater than C shows that energy increases as V is reduced, and it becomes infinite for V equals C. That means that the speed of light is a two-way barrier. Ordinary particles, like electrons, can never exceed light speed, and hypothetical V greater than C particles, tachyons, could never move slower than light because that would also take an infinite energy. Strangely, tachyons have to have an imaginary value for their mass m in order for this to work, meaning that their m squared is negative. This, of course, is in contrast to ordinary matter with a real mass or a positive m squared and photons or particles of light with a zero mass. The idea of faster-than-light particles does not really conflict with Einstein's ban on faster-than-light speeds. That's because the ban only applied to particles initially moving slower than light that were then slowly accelerated, two conditions Einstein stated in his 1905 relativity paper. Therefore, there'd be no problem with particles that always exceeded light speed from the very moment of their creation. Let's now consider how tachyons or other particles can be created. New particles or new mass can be created from energy based on Einstein's E equals mc squared. Here, for example, we see an animation of two protons colliding with just enough energy to create a new proton and a so-called antiproton. That's the P with the bar on top of it. We know that energy was just enough in this case to create the two particles because everything was at rest after the collision. So every bit of the initial energy was converted to mass. The creation of particles from energy occurs routinely in particle accelerators like the LHC, the largest one in the world located at CERN. In the LHC, counter-circulating beams of protons or other atomic nuclei collide with enough energy to produce as many as 20,000 particles per collision. Clearly, sophisticated data reduction tools are needed to make sense of what's coming out of these collisions, 
since there are around a billion such uh, collisions per second. The data rates are so high that experiments use real-time data analysis in order to select maybe a thousandth of 1% of the most interesting data for further analysis, permanently discarding the remaining 99.999%. Just as new matter can be created from energy according to E equals mc squared, one can also create energy from matter. This occurs spontaneously in the case of radioactivity, one form of which is known as alpha decay. Thus, when an uranium nucleus emits an alpha particle, there is a very slight loss of mass, and that mass loss is what accounts for the energy of the emitted alpha particle. For uranium, it is found that the alpha particles are emitted with an energy of 4.27 MeV, or million electron volts, which is a common energy unit when dealing with subatomic particles. If we had a bunch of uranium nuclei undergoing alpha decay, every single emitted alpha particle observed would have the same energy, apart from some inevitable measurement error. Thus, the spectrum, which shows the number or the fraction of decays occurring at each energy, could not be simpler. It's just a spike at 4.27 MeV. Beta decay is another form of radioactivity in which a beta particle, which is actually just an electron, is emitted from a radioactive nucleus. Just like alpha decay, if we know the mass lost by the nucleus, we can find the expected energy of the emitted electron. What we find, however, in an experiment is very different from the case of alpha decay. We no longer get a spike for the spectrum, but rather a continuous distribution. Thus, the electron always has an energy less than what is expected, meaning that some energy is always missing, sometimes more, sometimes less. For the most common observed energy, that is the peak of the spectrum, the amount missing is about two-thirds the expected amount, as the diagram shows. Wolfgang Pauli is the one who solved this missing energy problem by suggesting that some unobserved, very small mass neutral particle was emitted along with the electron and carried off some of the energy. Pauli called this missing particle the neutron, a name that was later changed by Enrico Fermi to neutrino meaning little neutral one in Italian. The neutrino is the ghostliest of all the known particles, given the great difficulty in observing them. They are also the only known particles that might be tachyons. That's because all the other particles that we know of have been observed to have a velocity less than light or a mass that is definitely not imaginary. In contrast, neither is true for the neutrinos. This cosmic ray animation done by NASA shows incoming cosmic rays producing showers of secondary particles when they enter the atmosphere. These showers yield information about the original cosmic ray particle. Much is still unknown about the cosmic rays, including how they attain their incredible energies, sometimes millions of times higher than any accelerator. Detection of cosmic ray particles used to involve highly sophisticated special equipment, but nowadays it can be done using your cell phone. If you want to contribute to cosmic ray research, you can easily do so by downloading the Crayfish app. The cosmic rays are a natural place to look for signs of neutrinos being tachyons. If neutrinos really are tachyons and could go back in time, Alan Chodos and colleagues have shown that certain otherwise impossible reactions involving beta decay could take place. In fact, in 1999, I wrote several papers showing that evidence for those reactions could be found in the cosmic ray data. More recently, in 2020, researchers have found time-reversed cosmic ray neutrinos coming out of the ground when they should have been coming down from space. Wolfgang Pauli originally thought neutrinos were unobservable particles. He had underestimated the ingenuity of experimental physicists, since they were eventually detected 26 years after Pauli proposed them. This was accomplished in 1956 by Clyde Cowan and Frederick Rhinus. 
From subsequent experiments, we now know that neutrinos come in three species of flavors. According to the commonly accepted view, the three flavors are each comprised of three different neutrino masses, which are so close as to be virtually indistinguishable in an experiment. The conventional view also ignores the possible existence of so-called sterile neutrinos. As weak as the interaction of normal or active neutrinos is with other matter, sterile neutrinos, if they exist, interact a trillion trillion times more weakly. They also have been considered to be a prime candidate for so-called dark matter. Neutrinos can pass through vast thicknesses of matter without being absorbed. Therefore, to detect many neutrinos, we must have a huge detector, like Super Kamiokande, which is normally filled with 50,000 tons of very pure water. Its size can be judged by the small boat on the right-hand side, where two people are inspecting some of the 11,000 light sensors that line the walls. Super K is located under Mount Aikino in Japan in order to filter out cosmic rays from space that might mimic neutrino events in the detector. Suppose a neutrino enters Super K from the left and knocks loose an electron from an atom that travels roughly in the original neutrino direction. If that electron speed is faster than light and water, it would create Cherenkov radiation. That Cherenkov shockwave would then activate a circular ring of photosensors lining the walls. The neutrino energy can be measured based on the number of sensors activated. In 2011, there was much excitement when a group at CERN, known as OPERA, initially reported they had observed neutrinos traveling faster than light. The experiment sent bunches of neutrinos from CERN through the Earth to a detector located 732 kilometers away in Italy. The excess above light speed reported was very tiny, only about three thousandths of one percent, but it was well outside the experimental uncertainty. Unfortunately, that initial opera result was an error, and when the experiment was redone, the result was consistent with light speed. That negative result, however, did not show neutrinos are not tachyons. That's because the true neutrino speed could have either been a tiny bit more or less than light. So how can we resolve the matter? Well, clearly much greater precision could be obtained if a much longer travel distance were used. For the greatest possible precision, we would want to observe a burst of neutrinos from a distant astronomical source. Supernovas are the one-time explosions of massive stars at the end of their lives. These explosions are very rare events, occurring only about twice a century in our galaxy, with most of them hidden from view by interstellar dust. One was observed in 1987, but you'd have to go back to before the telescope was invented in 1608 for the previous one seen by naked eye. When they occur, supernovas briefly outshine their entire galaxy with its hundreds of billions of stars. Remarkably, however, 99% of the energy emitted by supernovas is in the form of neutrinos rather than light. In addition, the neutrino emissions are largely confined to a very brief burst lasting a matter of seconds. When the supernova occurred on February 23, 1987, there were four neutrino detectors then in operation around the world. One of these was Kamiokanda the smaller predecessor to Super Kamiokanda. This graph shows the neutrino data that the detector recorded, with each dot showing one recorded event. The horizontal coordinates of a dot show the time it was recorded in minutes after 7 a.m. universal time, while the vertical coordinates show the number of photosensors that were hit or activated, a measure of the neutrino energy. For most of the 17 minutes displayed, we see only random noise below the level of 20 hits. However, during an interval lasting about 15 seconds, we can see an accumulation of around a dozen neutrino events, most of which have more than 20 hits. The other three detectors recorded at least five events each, 
occurring also in a very brief time interval. 30 neutrinos associated with the brief burst were observed in four neutrino detectors on February 23, 1987. In the standard analysis of this data, the burst in one detector under Mont Blanc is usually ignored. That burst is thought to be a random fluctuation as it weirdly arrived five hours earlier than the other three, which all arrived together in roughly a 15 second time interval. There are two reasons why that 15 second spread in arrival times occurred. The spread could either be due to a spread in the times neutrinos were emitted from the supernova or a spread in their travel times to reach Earth due to their different masses and energies. In the standard analysis, it is assumed that the three types of neutrinos all have nearly identical small masses, which leads to a negligible spread in their travel times. The standard analysis has yielded only an upper limit to the neutrino mass. In 2012 and 2013, I published a non-standard analysis of the 1987 neutrino data. Initially, I had ignored the five-hour early neutrino burst in the Mont Blanc detector, but later I understood how it could be included. The analysis remained agnostic on the near equality of the three neutrino masses and let the data speak for themselves. Most importantly, the analysis assumed that the main reason for the 15 second spread in neutrino arrival times was due to the spread in their travel times rather than their emission times from the supernova. These assumptions led to a rather remarkable result, namely that all 30 neutrinos clustered about three specific masses, one of which was imaginary, that is, with a mass negative mass squared. Let me give you a sense of how the non-standard analysis was done without using any equations. Suppose we had five neutrinos emitted simultaneously from the supernova with different energy E, but all having the same mass. The five neutrinos arrive at Earth at different times because of their different energies. It turns out that on a plot of one over the energy squared versus arrival time, the five neutrinos will all lie in a straight line whose slope tells you the common mass. The smaller the mass, the greater the slope. Thus, if we find groups of neutrinos clustering on differently sloped lines, we can deduce what masses are present in the actual data. Notice that positive m squared neutrinos arrive after light, while neutrinos with negative m squared arrive before light and cluster on a line with negative slope. What was found using this non-standard analysis was that remarkably all 30 neutrinos, including the five seen in the Mont Blanc detector, clustered on one of three straight lines corresponding to three specific masses, one being a tachyon. The result of my non-standard analysis of supernova 1987 neutrino data was a controversial three plus three model of the neutrino masses that I put forward in 2013. In the model, three sterile neutrinos were paired with three active ones having almost the same mass. Those three masses were very far apart, and one of the three had a negative mass squared. Of course, any neutrino model involving tachyons is going to need considerable supporting evidence before it is taken seriously. In fact, quite a bit of evidence for the model has been published since 2013, although I suspect it has been probably dismissed by many of the physicists who are aware of it. A new supernova in our galaxy would certainly be the ultimate test of the model, given the far greater sensitivity of today's neutrino detectors compared to those of 1987. While supernovas don't occur on a regular schedule, if the next one in our galaxy happened 50 years after the last one, I would then be age 121, five years older than the oldest man who ever lived. I've therefore been more interested in lab experiments that might test the model during my limited remaining time on this planet. As we saw earlier, neutrinos are emitted in the process of beta decay, which in fact was the reaction that gave Wolfgang Pauli the idea of proposing the ghostly particle in the first place. The shape of the spectrum, very close to the maximum electron energy, is dependent on the neutrino mass. 
So measuring that shape with high precision allows us to find a value for the mass in principle. Normally, people doing these experiments fit their observed spectrum to a single mass in view of the widespread belief that the three neutrinos have almost indistinguishable masses. The result of these experiments so far has been only an upper limit to the neutrino mass. The latest experiment to attempt a measurement of the neutrino mass, or at least a much reduced upper limit, is known as CATRIN, which is an international collaboration of 150 scientists, engineers, technicians, and students from five countries. CATRIN is based at KIT, the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany. The astonishing picture shows the main component of the experiment, the spectrometer, being hauled through a nearby town on the final leg of its journey to KIT after being fabricated in the town of Degendorf, 413 kilometers away. Equally astonishing, the trip from Degendorf to KIT required an 8,600 mile detour, mostly via ship, because German roads could not accommodate such a large piece of equipment. Katrin's results as of 2021 are that the neutrino mass is less than 9 tenths of an EV of a C squared. To put that value into perspective, an electron's mass is over half a million times greater. You might think that such a small upper limit on the mass would rule out the 3 plus 3 model with its three much larger masses. But because of the negative m squared tacky neutrino in the model, the net effective mass of the three can be very close to zero. It's similar to the way that three weights on one side of a seesaw can give an effective weight equal to zero and balance with nothing on the other side, provided that one of the three weights is negative in the form of a helium balloon. Thus, if we fit the observed spectrum using the 3 plus 3 model, the only difference from the fit to a standard one is two 1% bumps in the spectrum. The data that Katrin has taken as of 2021 do in fact show some indication of those two bumps being present, but the data are not yet sufficient to distinguish between the fits to 3 plus 3 model and that for a single small mass. Hopefully, by the end of the experiment, the data accumulated should be enough to tell whether the model with its tacky neutrino is right or wrong. I hope you have enjoyed this presentation and didn't find it too tacky. If you want to learn more about the hunt for the faster than light tachyon, check out the book or my Tachyon Nexus website. The book is both a personal memoir as well as a scientific detective story. It describes both my work as well as that of many other Tachyon hunters in seeking evidence for the existence of these elusive particles. It should be of interest to anyone curious about our universe. I didn't get a chance to talk about the three unicorns and the elephant herd, but that's all in the book.